Welcome to the Artfully Learning audio series. I'm your host, Adam Zucker. It's appropriate that this episode centers on the educational and creative potential of collaboration, because that's how I met today's guest, Victoria Manganello. Victoria and I were part of a curatorial collective called Alt Break, along with our colleagues Audra Lambert and Kimi Katata, where we organize exhibitions and public programming focusing on social and educational aspects of art. I'm excited to present you with this conversation between Victoria and I, where we will be discussing her multidisciplinary art that combines technology, engineering, craft, and intersectional feminism, among many other elements, as well as her embrace of collaboration in both her roles as an artist and educator. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear there you. There we go. Perfect. I believe I still make that mistake. The muting? Yeah, <laughs> well, it's it's weird, right? It's like a weird world of ethics on Zoom, keeping on mute, especially in the art world where we're all being put into these talks and then muted. Yeah. But yeah, it's good to see you. I was trying to remember, and I feel like our paths like cross in these kinds of shapes. I was trying to remember when we like actually first met because I don't remember. It was something to do with Audra or did we even meet before that? It was Audra. Yeah, it was okay. all break. Could it be 2015? Because I remember like that was a big, a lot happened in 2015 for me. So I, I don't know. I feel like it might have been part of 2015. Yeah. Yeah, it had to be. Wow. So that's, yeah, eight, eight years ago, I suppose. Look yeah. Us. Here we are. <laughs> BC, before <Yeah>. COVID times. <laughs> oh, man, I haven't heard that before, but it's a little too true. <laughs> so you're back in New York now? Yeah, I'm back in New York, but I'm only return. I've only um, been back for a couple of weeks because I was just in Switzerland um, for three months for a residency, which was really awesome and inspiring um, and a nice chance to take a semester off from teaching. I teach at, at both NYU and at Parsons, which I love doing, um, but it was kind of a nice reset to take one semester of a break, focus 100% on my own personal projects. And now I'm teaching five classes this semester, which is a um, pretty big load, but it's nice to be back in the classroom. Wow. Yeah, because we were also speaking, I think, to your Parsons. That was several oh, years yeah. ago, too. Oh, I remember just. Class. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I guess, I, unfortunately, it didn't really transpire yeah. into anything tangible, but the ideas came. And that was, I think, the important part. Like the, the yeah. students seemed to be getting at least the process of talking amongst themselves and thinking about projects and working with outside curators. So hopefully it was at least good for them. These things happen. Yeah, my attitude is always like, if an idea comes up, give it a try. And then the worst case scenario is that it doesn't materialize, but um, at least you gave it a shot. And then sometimes they really do turn into something and it's it's worth it to have a couple of misses if you're going to get ultimately get a cool project out of that sort of attitude and practice. I agree. Yeah. And just having that mindset is where I kind of wanted to start off Perfect. with our chat. So. There's a debate among art teachers and possibly the larger contemporary art community as well as to whether or not process or product is more important in art education. And your work is a great example to show how process and product are integral to one another. I even think that they inform each other in a nonlinear way or maybe some kind of cycle of assessment through making and analyzing the objects you make. Mm. So in other words, the ideas and applications used within your work are learned from both the active process and a visual reflection of the product. That's how I see the way you work and present your art. So perhaps if you could take us on the journey behind what goes into the making of a work of art and when do you consider the work to be complete? Yeah, I really appreciate that observation and this question. Um, before I answer it explicitly, I think the first thing I want to, want to say is that I have this discussion or I ask this question or one like it frequently um, with my students, um, especially when they're feeling a block. You know, are you the type of artist that wants to start with a story or a message and find the materials, the shape, the form, the scale that's going to help you tell that story or message? Or are you the sort of artist that's going to start with materials or with a technique or with a tool, play with those things, make, iterate, uh, produce, and then discover the story along the way? And usually I find with my students, this question can be helpful when they're feeling a block because identifying one or at least selecting one as an option to try for the upcoming project can help get things moving. 
Uh, I also think that the art world and um, as a consequence, these academic institutions that are funneling into the art world really want us to always have some big message or story or concept, but many of us are actually makers at heart and are inspired by our materials. And that's certainly me. I love making stuff and manipulating materials and working with tools. Um, my concepts often come later or, or come during the monotony of the process when my brain has that chance to wander because I've got uh, four million knots to tie <laughs> along my journey to making a finished woven piece. And in that repetition, my brain can sort of study or ruminate over a, a topic or a thing that I'm thinking about. And ultimately the piece becomes about that thing simply because of the time it took to make and, and discover it. Um, maybe craft arts in particular, like give us permission to lean into the making. Um, and I really love when I can see craft materials and craft techniques in an arts space. Um, maybe because of that reason, like it gives people that permission to find stories in their tools and their materials and, the, and their making processes. But that whole divide of, of like process and product is kind of like a, a myth, you know, both are very real and important, but I think it's like a myth in terms of like, what, what's the best way to teach and what's the best way to make art? What do you do in your practice and also your pedagogy? It's a combination of both. Another symptom of it, I think, is the way that our industries and again a consequent as a consequence our academic institutions um is that we separate art in design so distinctly like we really want to see that they're two distinct things and we don't always give permission for our to our students to make functional art or applied design you could say um, and it's something i'm trying to embrace both as an educator and as a maker into the future what it might mean for some of my work to fall into one of those other categories um, because why not i think it's a symptom of like a really arbitrary reason because we want art to stay pure or something like that and the the commodification or the capitalism of the design world sullies the art but we all know that there's plenty of capitalism and commodification happening over in art too. And so there's all of these interesting uh, suspicions about why they're separated, but I think it can be a little bit freeing to let them be more overlapping. And I, I think it's also more generous to the artists to remind them that they can maybe sell a thing <laughs> or that their work has a value. Uh, many of us are plagued with this idea that we're supposed to just be like struck with the vision and we make an abstract object that no one's ever going to be able to afford because it took us so long or because it's too unique. And um, I, I would like to make some money being an artist. And I think as um, when we can create stuff that's applied or that's craft work related, it's more likely to be consumable and therefore provide us with a security. Sure. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And that's what's refreshing to me about your work and also the way you teach, because I've seen the interactions you have with the students too, from the unfinished project. We'll call it ongoing. It's a life process. But that's what's refreshing to me about all of that is the mindset you have and the identity that you have to call yourself an artist and also a craft person, and also that there's really no true distinction between the two. They're, they're so interrelated. And the history of art started in that way with artists and workers anyway. It was all this patron system, which capitalism has manipulated and really devalued the labor that goes into making art. And it's a weird way, though, because it devalues the artist in a way and inflates the artwork. And that's crazy how it separates the the actual humanity from then this object that's put on the pedestal. And so that goes back to the first thing we discussed, the process and the product. They're really using the artists and art educators as this, the labor force. And then they're taking the work and marketing it up and people at the top are getting the money. It's the same old trickle down economic <laughs> system. But we don't usually get into like Marxism or any of that on, on these talks here, but, but it's, you know, it's definitely something that I appreciate when artists talk about it, especially accomplished artists like yourself and educators. In your case, you have an influence in different avenues, speaking to other artists and speaking to future artist students or future designers and telling them, you know, it doesn't really matter what you call yourself. You're a creative, you're going out there, you're changing the world, your ideas are being put into motion, they're becoming actions and products. If you, if you choose to make products, you could also make experiences, we know. That's what I really find refreshing to hear from an artist and an educator. 
And that breaking of the boundaries and blurring the lines between art and design, it's strange that that's still a debate too. We're talking about a lot of these myths like art and design being so separate, like art and illustration being so separate. It's like, I feel like the basic tenets are very similar similar like habits of mind. I mean, the product is different and sometimes the process too is different in the conception, but it's really more similar than not. We're all really in that same field as creatives. So that brings me to my next question. One thing we've talked about before are your interests in science, technology, engineering, and math, and how the history of technology, gender identity, and storytelling is also connected to your practice of weaving and using very intricate networks of textiles, colors, and cultural meaning. So one thing I found fascinating and enlightening to learn from you was that the history of weaving and textiles is intrinsic to the evolution of telecommunications and computers. When you mentioned this, I looked it up and I saw so much uh, information about it, but still not like a common knowledge amongst many people in our collective culture. But it makes sense because weaving has a history and oral tradition, and it also connects us through sharing in both the process and utilitarian function of weaving. So what first drew you to this medium? And if you can speak about your vital research into the history of weaving as communication, education, and a precursor to modern technology and computing, that would be amazing because I'm, I'm sure, like myself, people will be hearing it for the first time from your description. Yeah, Adam, thank you for that question. I, l- I love talking about this stuff. And I think I'm one of those people like you who heard it for the first time and thought could that be true? Looked it up and found this whole world of story. Um, I, as an artist, I think the first thing I wanted to do with that feeling was compare the, or, or use it as a way to point out the things that are all around us that we don't notice. So clothing, um, bed sheets, rugs, towels, these are things we all use every day. Textiles are part of our lives every moment from the day we're born to the day we die but most of us are unfamiliar with those materials how they're made whose hands made them what happens to them when we're finished using them etc um, and we la- we now live in a world where technology functions quite similarly in from the day we're born to the day we die we rely on And I should say modern technology or electronic technology, because weaving has always been a form of technology before we were able to harness the power of electricity. Um, But we just live in this world where we we still no longer really think about how those things that we rely on function, whose hands, again, whose hands are involved in generating that energy, processing it, what happens to it when we're done. Um, So that was really this first kind of story I wanted to tell with my art by making a woven computer, let's say, or a woven screen, it was a chance for us to be surprised and then hopefully therefore notice those things that are all around us that should be equally surprising maybe or, or exciting. But I don't have a formal or really any background in um, electronics, for sure, engineering. My training is as an educator and as an artist. And in my undergraduate degree, I focused on making textiles and weaving in a very analog way. Um, My interest in these new themes that we're discussing has been juxtaposed with a lot of collaboration and working with people who come from that other side and many of my long-term and um, very valued and beloved collaborators are ones who actually share really similar interest but are coming at it from the tech side Um, and so the the people that have worked on those projects together with me have electrical engineering backgrounds product design backgrounds they're working with 3d printers and design softwares and then we can put two heads together and create something that tells that story materially but then also because of our two shared distinct experiences and then again we sort of come back to the beginning which is that we we have a very similar connection to these these two things even though we've got two professions because that's what it just means to be a human in this world is um, being connected to those things and so as i go forward in my career and start new projects i think i'm kind of constantly coming back to that idea like what can a technology be what can a screen be what can communication or information be and how does it change when we focus on the materiality of it like what if instead of turning on my light switch by 
popping a, a plastic piece in the wall that goes like this, I stroke a piece of velvet and that's the way the, the lights go on. Like what is going to change about my life if I get that soft or sensual or, um, you know, activating these other senses with my technology. Um, so that keeps bringing me back to using textiles um, and technology as a way to explore what could potentially change in our interaction with both things. Yeah, I, you know, I just thought of when you're saying that how the main things that we wear today are textile and technology. It's a phone and our clothes and why not integrate them even further? And your work has made connections to people early pioneers or early uh, forerunners, I like to say rather than pioneers, uh, forerunners of computer technology, silk weavers like Joseph Marie Jacquard, I think that's mm -hmm. how you say his name, how that has created this whole lineage going from textile to the technology we have today. I'm, I'm working on another project and I can't recall if I've shared it with you yet. I probably have in some capacity, but it's um, a documentary series about the different industries that utilize textiles in, in all these different ways. So we've so far been speaking today a little bit about where electronics and textiles overlap, but of course technology can take many forms and this project um, that I'm working on is going to tell us even more stories, both about where textiles are being used in other industries, healthcare, sports, music, space exploration, automotive, you know, you name it, I'm hoping to include it. Um, but another layer to that and I, I thought to say this based on your hesitation around the word pioneer, actually, because I want with this project to talk about who are the the people in these stories that are, first of all, forgotten and second of all, lost to history and will never know um, their contribution. So Joseph Marie Jacquard, I, I like to tell my students that we give credit to Joseph Marie Jacquard for inventing the Jacquard loom, which automated was the first automated task production tool period, but automated weaving so that we could create complex textiles quickly and, and less expensively. But he had plenty of people working for him. And one in particular, um, it sort of in the story of his invention was Ada Lovelace, who luckily has gotten a lot of attention and credit recently. She was um, working with Charles Babbage, who designed the difference machine. And, you know, she we might think of her as the first coder in the modern sense. And for a long time, we didn't give her any credit for that. Now she does get the credit that she's owed. Um, but, you know, what about the people that deserve that credit, but we never have the chance to give it to them because they've, their story's been lost to history. Um, in many cases, those that have been left out have been marginalized um, populations. And the work that I'm doing is particularly focused on the women um, that have been left out of the stories of innovation because craft has always been a, um, a thing stewarded by women until it became an economic space for men to come in and take over the stewarding. Um, so anyway, that that's a maybe a, a a new topic that I'm bringing us towards, but it was one I wanted to share in response to what you said. Yeah, thank you for making that that point. Yeah, it's because pi when I said pioneer too, you know, it immediately draws connection to like things like seminal and all this patriarchal right. dialogue that is both factually problematic and also culturally wrong. It contributes to a history of marginalization, like you perfectly said. And of course, in the arts, that's something we really need to be cognizant of and let our students make these discoveries for themselves as well to find the hidden histories and that then they can work to reveal them, teaching others or making art about it that really draws our attention to people who were integral and forgotten or erased. Maybe it's more of a sense of erasure. The project you were describing, is that the Women Interwoven? Yes, it the is. The documentary? Yes. So is that out yet? Is it? Oh, you just mentioned you're working on it. So yeah. when when is that going to be available to screen and premiere? That's, I've been looking forward to that for a while. Yeah. I am looking forward to it too. It's um, not available yet, and I don't have a, a date or um, you know a clear projection. Um, it maybe is an opportunity to talk about the amount of work that these kinds of creative projects take as artists, because no one's paying me to to do this research. Um, in fact, the any any like money that has been exchanged to make this happen has either come. I've I have had a, a healthy group of friends and family donate to a GoFundMe, but all of that money has been funneled into my paying 
for certain re research assets and web domains, et cetera, um, doing a lot of grant writing and a lot of pitching and a lot of research and talking um, quite regularly to women who are sharing their story with me and are making a commitment to be part of the project. So I'm really hopeful that soon I'll get the funding to put it out in the world. And once that funding comes through, I'm ready to jump because I've got a list of about 40 women around the world who work in all these different industries um, and are willing to share their stories with us. And it's been um, a long process of, of researching and preparing it, but an interesting, you know, on this topic we're discussing, an interesting pivot I made in the planning was in um, including a variety of voices. At first, I thought I would do it where it would be one woman per episode. And she would be in this sort of, um, I can call now, now that I've had this revelation, she would be in this sort of hero narrative. And then I realized, oh, that's actually the thing that I'm trying to show us not to do because nobody does anything alone. It's the, the we've gotten ourselves into this trouble because we've pretended like there's just one hero that invented the one thing. We give them all the credit. We don't talk about the thousands of people um, that help them get to that position of power. So I've, I've sort of restructured the project so that every theme, let's say it's healthcare, will include the stories of many women at the top of the food chain and, and all the way down, working in different aspects of those industries so that we can really understand just how many hands and minds go into innovation. Yeah, it's definitely a collaborative effort. I think it's great too, because people like to talk about who they're inspired by as well. So it gives them a chance to pay it back or in some way form a connection between past or present mentors and in general, just form that dialogue that art is a linear conversation, even you know, with our past, with our ancestors, with people who we didn't have a chance to speak to in person for various reasons. But it gives us that opportunity across the boundaries and borders and you know, weaving and interconnecting our various cultures and identities and showing how you know, it creates that tapestry, it's, which is a better word too than melting pot. You know, I like tapestry or people say like mixing bowl or things like salad. that. Yeah. Salad bowl. We're not like melted together. We, we each are individual identities making one beautiful tapestry or quilt or painting that has the different elements that go into it. And like you said, collaboration is a large part of art. The key is to really focus in on that collaboration where people are just able to tell their stories and are supported in a group setting too. So we could shift to maybe speaking about collaboration and how it is really where education and maybe artistic practice is best suited, I think. Yeah, I, I've always really thought of my, if, if my practice or just like my whole um, purpose in my work it, as an onion, I've always thought the core of it was pedagogy and education and being an educator. It's always been the thing that um, let's say has been the most fruitful that I've ha felt the most joy from. Um, I love working with students. I love that feeling when you can like spark, sh you show something to someone that you love and then you see them love it. It's what's better than that. It's always been one of my most cherished uh, aspects of my practice. And then the outer layers of the onion being the work that I'm creating myself and, and the programs that I'm generating and collaborating on. And you know, it's funny when I reflect back in saying that, and now I've been an educator in a, in a university setting for nearly seven years, but when I reflect back to my own time in school, I think I really learned there this idea that I should be the author of everything I make and that I need to make a name for myself and I need to be represented by a gallery with my name on the wall. And I regret in, in many um, instances as I look back on the times that I didn't give credit to the collaborators that I relied on. And I think in part I was resisting that because of the education that I had. That's not to say that I didn't have some really fabulous and progressive educators. I certainly did. Uh, it's a symptom of a, of a larger, bigger system that's much harder to change. Um, but I definitely was really eager to make a name for myself and in doing so didn't always give credit to everyone that helped. And it's, it's now in the last four or five years that I've been thinking about this a lot that I've come to realize seems obvious, but sometimes we have to unlearn these things. The credit is not a limited resource, <laughs> you know, in a way it's actually 
better for me when I get to include the names of all the people that touch the projects I'm working on, because then I get to be associated with their awesomeness. Um, and so I try now to bring that into my classrooms and, and help my students unlearn what I um, what was really cemented into me that being an artist does not have to be a solo thing that can for some people, not everyone, but for some be kind of a miserable way to be an artist. Um, it's often not true. Um, the idea that we can do stuff by, all by ourselves is actually impossible. And then when you're faced with that impossibility, you can feel really down on yourself and it can be isolating and scary and you feel bad that why, you know, it seems everyone around me has figured this out. Why can't I? Um, so I, I'm attempting to change that for my students, maybe help them get to that revelation that I reached much later, um, sooner for in their career. And I'm also trying my best going forward to really give credit to everyone in, who's involved and uplift them. And I want to go back in time to, um, in the ways that's possible without a time machine and, you know, update my website and, and make sure that I include all the names. Cause again, it's, it's just, um, really become clear to me that I don't have to, um, hoard that credit for myself. It's, it's not any less, my authorship is not any less valuable if there are more names on the projects I'm creating. Yeah. Perfectly said. I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and the term unlearning, like unschooling is something that might sound hypocritical for educators to say, but it's really, I, I personally have been getting into that whole concept of unschooling and learning about it more and finding maybe ways that it could be integrated into the traditional methods of schooling. You know, unschooling we're talking about for people who might not know, it's basically a push against the traditional compulsory education. And then in higher education, it's a push against the rules and regulations sort of to speak. And maybe that's another myth is that like to break the rules, you first have to learn them because what are the rules? We're still making it up as we go along, especially in art and education. It's really been apparent throughout history that yeah there's been some quote-unquote canon but is that really the best representation of culture in general i don't think so because we're talking about how it marginalizes and erases so many people so i loved what you said and how you have been looking and assessing your own career and learned from that and and how that has shifted your practice going forward and uh, you're still creating the great art that you wanted to but you're making it such a accessible and social process too which is where the the idea of unschooling can really help with art education and education at large and the arts teach us that too we just have to really hone in on it i mean k through 12 art education does it and i'm seeing it a lot too in professors like yourself sort of challenging the system i think that was just the great point about the education of collaboration and you spoke to that perfectly yeah i guess the next thing it brings to my mind is like how do i get my students to practice collaborating um and i've tried it in a lot of different ways um you know group group projects are really in my opinion at least at the college level i guess it can be very different depending on the age and the and the group you're working with but i found them to be not the most successful in general and definitely in terms of collaboration because a good collaboration is between two people that have something in common that they want to work together on and when you're in a classroom it doesn't mean that you are in a room full of natural collaborators or ones that would make sense for you um and i actually had a question so it's perfect timing for our conversation in class this past week where one of my mfa textiles students asked me, um, how do you find a collaborator? What does that, what does that look like? How do I do it? And we had a, a, br a brief brainstorm and I asked some of the other students if they'd ever done collaborations and we all shared our experience in doing that and reaching out. And I'm, I've been thinking about her question since and what could I do to facilitate some sort of learning experience in the classroom that could help them um, both practice collaboration on its own, but then second of all, practice finding the right collaborator. I haven't found the answer yet, but it would be interesting for the community that you're building here for us all to think about that together. Um, some of the people that I've collaborated with have been dear friends who I still have so much love and respect for, but weren't the most natural collaborator for me. And then I found some of my long-term collaborators. Um, I met them when we started collaborating. I met them because I was looking for a collaborator. So it's not like there's a formula, at least in my experience. I mean, that's a fantastic question from a student. I would have been 
taken aback a bit. And uh, of course, we both have experience collaborating, and that's how we met collaborating. Mm-hmm. But it's, as you say, it's really not one right answer to it. And I also find that working with close friends has usually been good. But again, there's times when that doesn't work for various reasons, because you have prior knowledge of the person too. And and that all gets, there's bias in everything, I think too. And in collaboration, it really brings out whether we like to admit it or not, there's definitely judgment and there's definitely ego. And there's definitely all these things that we have to learn to put in check. And you're working with people with different temperaments, different life experiences. But for me, that's always been educational and informative. And I've learned so much from it. And I I feel definitely grateful being in a place like New York, where you do meet random people at an art event and just strike up a a quick conversation, maybe like two minutes, and you'll think nothing really of it. And then a few months later, you embark on like this collaborative endeavor with them. Somehow you get reintroduced or they just reach out or you reach out because something sparks. Oh yeah, this person mentioned that they were interested in this and I want to learn more about this. And they have the skills and I have these skills and we're going to make it work or at least try. But collaboration, it's definitely important to learn from the start. That's why we do it as early as we go into schools and they teach us to share. They put us in groups or assign seating and switch it up every now and then. And things work, things don't work. It's all trial and error really in the beginning. But the goal is the same. It's to get people to find the best ways to interact with each other and find ways to understand one another. So I think that's the important takeaway from that. Yeah. Well, I'll keep you posted on what comes because I do want to try to conceptualize some sort of activity for us in this class. Um, and maybe some of my students would be willing to um, share at the end of the semester with um, us in a conversation about what that felt like. And I, yeah, I'm just curious from other educators in the community that you're forming with these projects, what other folks think we should do. I would love to hear their assessments right on it when they've had a whole semester to think about it and practice it. Yeah. You know, speaking to other artists, I just spoke last week to uh, Richard Dolan, who's an artist who works in the uh, marine biology field. He's uh, He's got this really unique role where he creates educational sculpture that he uses for like haptic learning while he's on a boat giving whale watch tours. He mentioned to me that it's been a while since he showed at a gallery, but his art's out there in the world more often than an artist who would maybe have a show at a gallery every four months. And it's reaching more audiences and different audiences. And I think that's what we all want as an artist, ideally, is just to have our work be embraced by more people than just art world people. We want people who are not even really interested in art, people who say, I don't like art, I don't get art. We want those people to look at the work and be like, wow, okay, I see the connection between this. And it reminds me of making something with my grandmother or a trip that I took with a loved one or to bring that back to collaboration. It's like we're opening ourselves up to outside interests and unfamiliar experiences. Collaboration leads us to expanding our own interests and knowledge. For example, you're learning a lot from the women that you're giving the platform for them to tell their stories. That's a process that has, I'm sure, informed you. You've learned a lot from it. And then as viewers of the show, we're going to learn a lot and it never ends. And that's what I love about learning. We don't want to be put in a box. It's fine to be just an artist, but changing the definition of what an artist is, is important. We don't want to be limited because we are change makers and we're, I don't want to say we're more important than being an artist because an artist is a very important profession. It gets taken for granted, but people don't truly understand that, you know, an artist is an integral collaborator and person who works with others. And because they work with others, that's where the work becomes really successful. Yeah. I I really appreciate about being an artist. What, you know, it's often hard to do (laughs) for so many reasons, but what I think it, Get, uh, what is easy about it in a sense is that there is this openness that I can make a documentary, a painting, a classroom curriculum, and a cookbook, and it's all part of my job. Uh, that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm definitely frequently grateful that this is all um, gets to be all a part of one thing and one identity. And then in in because of that, I get a bit more permission to not be an expert in any of those things. Um, I've never made a cookbook before, but because I'm an artist, I can just go ahead and do it. Um, and maybe that's a little bit of my own um, lack of inhibition. I just dive into stuff, but I do think it's this title of artist, this, this 
profession, so to speak, that lets me make an experimental documentary, an experimental cookbook. Um, and it's there's much less flexibility and much less creativity offered to folks that have conventional jobs, even though I'm sure their voices would be very much appreciated and essential in the spaces where art gets to be. Um, there's so much so many voices that we don't get to hear because of the limitations of their professions. Sure. And I'm sure you've experienced this too, talking with people like that. And I have too. They appreciate that because doctors, you know, scientists, they're creative people, of course. Yeah. I mean, being a skilled surgeon is an art, but at the same time, you can't, you don't have the luxury uh, to be an artist and, oh, let me just look at this one or uh, this organ <laughs> would look better here, you know? So, so it's like, I mean, imagine that, but like, an artist would think that that's the, the the freedom that we have but yeah at the same time like they appreciate what we do because we do dream up these innovative schemes or scenarios that are based in reality and in the social sciences and we make work that's based on the medical profession or natural sciences mathematics and we repurpose it in this way that may be fantastical now but maybe in the future it's possible and there's been certainly been examples of like artists who have made innovative innovative discoveries in other fields or who have their work has led to collaborations with doctors, scientists, mathematicians to create new ways of thinking and innovations in multiple fields going at once. So I think the best part about being an artist is that we are allowed to dream. We're given permission to them. People expect that of us. We're also taken seriously in, in other fields and we're invited into that and vice versa. They want to come into the arts. Now in medical schools, they encourage their students to de-stress by going to art museums and taking art classes. Art strengthens their motor skills and critical thinking. It's like, yeah, we have strict guidelines in our profession, but we can also dream and we can also apply really creative, innovative or just fantastical art processes into our thinking overall and become more well-rounded and empathetic in our practice. I think that's why art is essential, why it's as essential as medicine or as essential as saving the whales. I mean, we're applying it to save the environment. Yeah. And just to like kind of flip that logic, I, I think often about how if I had learned art in my other classes like in science or chemistry or math i may have entered those fields because uh, like the creativity that is easy for me to find in art making may have then given me a door into those other disciplines because i'm i'm naturally um accepting of and i can understand that sort of mindset like for example math and weaving are very uh, or sorry, uh, knitting and weaving are very mathematical and I'm doing math constantly as I'm preparing my knits and my wovens and all of that. So if I had learned those things in like geometry in high school or even sooner, who knows, I may have become a mathematician or I make a lot of my own colors and pick, I use pigments and I have a real um, chemical process in creating just the right formula to get the right color for my materials. If I had learned that in chemistry class, I may have become a scientist. So there's just this nice um, bridge that the, the fields can um, generate when they're collaborative. And I would love to see more of that in education at an earlier time. Um, and perhaps we'd get a whole new sort of professional scientist or mathematician or lawyer or, you know, any of any of these other professions that aren't technically artful. That's a great point. I, I think that's probably a common point for many of us who are in the arts that we've seen artists now like yourself and like for me looking at Jennifer Bartlett's work where she uses the grid and its ratios and numbers. It's like, wow, I understand these things looking at her work, but I had no idea what my teacher was saying when he was writing numbers and X's and whatever on the board. I had no idea I was lost in math, but I've learned, honestly, more math and more like complex geometry and math from art than I could have in a math textbook. And that's not to say that one way is better than the other. It's just for us, we're inclined and we're passionate about art. And so it's good that you can make art that connects to chemistry and connects to geometry. I feel like that's where we should be training or educating 
future students in general. I don't want to say future artists, but any like where anyone can be an artist, but they don't have to work in the art profession. They can be an artist chemist. And of course, color theory is an artistic invention that is integral to chemistry and these sciences in general, the natural sciences. So we really need to shift our mindset towards that, like you said. I'm glad that that's becoming a thing in some schools, because what do you think about like STEAM? I mean, there's like, they just added the A maybe not too long ago, but it was like, people still say STEM too much, you know, and I like to always correct them by saying STEAM. Oh, what's the A? It's like, come on. But uh, that's where we're still at. There's room, obviously, for improvement, of course. But that was not a thing when I was in school. Did you hear about STEM? I mean, it was the very tail end, I think, of like high school when I first heard this word STEM. At that point, I was like too far into the arts. Like my guidance counselor's like, you know, it's just like, okay, you're the one hope for you is is art and music. So that's where you're going to focus on. You know? But if I had heard this like STEM and maybe they had incorporated it when we were in school like they do now, it, it would have been maybe game changing. But yeah, of course, adding the A was an obvious step because STEM is artful at its nature. Yeah, I don't remember either when I first heard the, the term STEM um, or STEAM. Of course, STEAM came much later. But uh, like you, I don't think it was early enough that it could have impacted my own trajectory as a student. It must have come after, um, or at least it must have been like ubiquitous enough uh, only after. And I think yeah, I, I wish that that had been around. I'm glad it's around now. And I, I guess one of the things that it might have done for me, and maybe it does for artful young people now is representation, you know, like you see that a in there, and you're like, that's me, I'm, I'm part of this. And then you get included, just in the way that our um, the queer acronym has grown over time to include more people so that we can represent the people that are meant to be in that category. It's just nice to see yourself in a group. And um, that's a human thing, not, not an artist thing, of course. Um, so I guess this is just a theory, but I wonder if that is an element to the, the strategy is just including the A in order to have a place for A's like us to to be. I hope so. I like to think that too. And I'd like to think too that it adds to this idea, like you mentioned, with general unity and collaboration. I think ideally, I don't know if this is the reason to have it, but to me, it screams collaboration. It's like steam, you know, they're putting these things together for a reason, especially if they're using it and they're stressing that this is the way to the quote unquote job force, or they've been focusing on these programs for the past few years with the intent of bringing people into this advanced digital age, growing digital age. And now we have things like AI making our artwork for us. But these are all things that are, are collaborations in general too. The computer scientists collaborating with artists. You need to have a background and a knowledge about aesthetics and computers to do something like AI. So I do think it's a strategy. And whether traditional education is using this strategy right or correctly or, or strategically, for lack of a better word, uh, that's up for debate because there's obviously too many cuts to the arts in school still, and there's still this STEM business and not STEAM. So it's kind of like there's room for improvement for sure. It's good to feel included, that's for sure. And I think, you know, our voices are going to be the ones that make that part of the new normal in education part of the curriculum. Well, one of the the next things I feel like I have to share about stuff that I'm doing in, in the context of this conversation is I've just recently formed a collective with um, basically the people I've already been collaborating with on other projects, but we've decided to formalize our collaboration um, into a collective. And uh, we're looking for ways to kind of create this identity that embraces all of this, like the magic of collaboration, the wisdom of collaboration. And in particular, we all have these different backgrounds that touch on the STEAM um, spaces. And we have aspirations to form and structure the, the group or the collective as um, a studio where others can come in and collaborate with us, like we can create some kind of framework that facilitates collaboration. Uh, it's really new. I think we've only just been 
giving ourselves this name the last four or five months, but um, maybe maybe it would be interesting for us to all talk to you for this podcast so that we could speak more about these conversations. I'd love to. I'd love to have everyone on. Uh, what, what's the name of it? It's called oh. Craft Work. Oh, I love um, it. <laughs> yeah. For many yeah. reasons. <laughs> Yeah, for many reasons. And we debated the name for a while, but we realized that um, we wanted to focus on craft materials. We wanted to focus on work and labor, and we wanted to um, create projects together. And and it's funny how since forming it and for making it formal, even though we've all been working and talking and being friends for many years, so it's not the the work that we're doing isn't new it's just the box that it's in that's new we've already seen a slight change in the way these projects are being received there's some sort of clout that we seem to get in the industry professional design side of all of this because we're a unit um and that has been so interesting to observe um it makes sense to me in a way like you, you know the package of us all together brings so much um, we really get the whole steam amongst the four of us um, but it's also curious that we were all working together before it's we just didn't have a name so why is it that formalizing something makes it real that's great so craft work is it going to be in the form of like like a workshop a sort of an atelier or is it going to be nomadic in terms of where you go i'm sure because that's the organic structure it sounds like yeah we're really figuring it out as it as it goes um but i think we want to figure out a way to collaborate as we have been um with a bit more structure that we hope then will facilitate honestly getting paid to do it um because of if if we can sort of like be united and work together and we we hope to like generate a bigger network we're four now but um there's something really um compelling to me and many others about solidarity and i like I like this concept that we can sort of stick together, um, put out projects, give it a fair price tag and, and let people um, work with us who are willing to value our time. Um, and it's I, I'm really trying to work on that. And I think others in our group are a little better at it. So I'm grateful that I get to have them um, advocate for us and our our compensation and the creative projects that people want us to generate. That's fantastic. Yeah, we'll have to follow that and follow up on it and have everyone on because I like to learn more about it. And I think it's something that would be educational and inspiring for people who are in similar positions where they are looking to expand their own interests and their own skill set. The, the whole idea of the Renaissance person is actually another myth or bu- myth busters. This, this show could be called, but uh, <laughs> it's not like Renaissance person. It's like Renaissance community, which is the, the crux of what I think the Renaissance actually was. When you're looking back at art history, it's like the not one true genius. These ideas were based on a collaboration of people who were engineers engineers, artists, mathematicians, all working together and socializing together with your work, with craft work. This is the combination of people coming together, forming a group, bouncing ideas off each other, putting things into plan and then implementing them. Any other projects we could discuss? We could talk about the cookbook if if it made sense with the, the story. Yes, right. I guess we'll wrap things up on the cookbook, another collaboration. You mentioned that earlier briefly, how it's something you felt as an artist, you had permission or freedom to do creatively. So yeah, if you wanted to talk about that, that'd be great. And it's very educational indeed. Yeah. And it's great that you're, that we've worked on it together and that your recipe is included in it. It's um, a project I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud of all the things that I put out into the world, but there's a particular sort of pride in a project like this because it has 37 voices in it, of which yours and mine are two. Um, and it's just a, such an interesting group of, of people. And um, the recipes that are included in the cookbook all provide um, experimentally instructions for making food with instructions for making some sort of social change or impact, thinking about the metaphors that um, making food offers us. And the recipes have been contributed by people all around the world. And we have, um, I think, maybe 17 nationalities represented and lots of different food um, being produced in there. Um, I guess this might be the first place I'm publicly saying it, not that I speak publicly publicly very often, but we're working with a press in Boston called Snake Hair Press, and they're going to be um, 
producing the book for us and putting it out into the world so soon enough people will be able to buy it which i'm very very excited about um and it's something that started in the beginning of the pandemic when so many of us were doing or had a different relationship to our kitchen I, I think a lot of us were learning and working there in ways that we hadn't before i know that was my story i was kind of stuck in the kitchen uh, at home um in a way i hadn't ever been before the pandemic um and yeah it's it's a it's a very cool collection of recipes and i'm looking forward to it growing into something that's bigger than a book as well i want to do more uh, recipe writing workshops of which we've done a few um over the past couple of years and exhibitions and other dinners and happenings and uh it's a it's an exciting space for collaboration to continue our conversation and i've already noticed people meet one another because of of being included in this um there was one romanian artist and one american artist based in new york and they did a thing over zoom where they both cooked marlene from romania's recipe together and it was it was just a nice collaboration to talk about what collaborations can look like it was a brief one it was just a few hours where they cooked together from their two different kitchens but it was really special um to see that come from the book i love that yes and it's definitely amazing to just look, there's so many recipes and they're not all traditional. They redefine what recipe can be. Again, it goes back to our conversation of how artists can go in and, and really recreate and re redefine. It's been an inspiring conversation. And of course, I am grateful to be included in that You Stir the Pot project. Uh, and I'm also really thankful for the opportunities to learn from the work you're doing. I love talking about this stuff and I appreciate um, that you've generated this platform. And I always tell my educator friends to check out what you're doing because I, I really like the chance for us to look critically at what pedagogy can be. So thank you for creating this space for all of us. But yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. Okay. Take care. Bye for now. This concludes another episode of the Artfully Learning audio series. Thank you to everyone out there for joining me. Thank you to my guest, Victoria Manganello. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel, check out the other episodes, and hit the like button to show your support. Thanks again. Take care. Bye.